Welcome in this video where we are talking about how we can practically use induced voltage and current in our day-to-day -day life. Now, one of the most common applications for the, the whole induced voltage system is either a dynamo or an AC current generator. Now, both of these devices try to convert mechanical energy, meaning a rotation of some sort, into a current via uh, this whole lens law system. Uh, the source of the, the rotation itself can be a lot of different things. It can be steam power generated through nuclear energy, coal burning, gas burning, all these sorts of things. Just a simple rotation of the wheels on your bike is enough to generate some uh, some voltage and therefore current. Um, but the conversion of to electricity always happens in a very similar manner. In a previous video, we studied that it doesn't necessarily matter all that much whether you use the coil to move around or that if you move the magnet around it will lead to a very similar situation either an increase or a decrease in flux um, and that sort of triggers an opposite reaction from the whole thing um, this first picture I showed here is one where you will be turning the, the coil uh, with the north and south pole on each end creating a radial magnetic field very similar to the motor now I've shown you this picture because essentially what we're studying here is the, uh, the the DC motor but in reverse we use a DC motor to use current to create a rotation using Lorentz force however in this case we have something that moves on its own and that can generate a current for us so this is sort of the reversal of this one now in order to explain what happens I've uh, simplified it a bit and I've decided to make it the magnet that turns around in my uh, schematic here. If you have your magnet turning around and one side of your magnet is considered the North Pole, the other the South Pole, let's say you start turning this uh, clockwise in this case. And in this first 180 degrees of a clockwise rotation, I'm going to show you what happens. So the first 180 degrees, when we start turning this, we have to see it from the point of view from this coil. In that first 180 degrees, it is essentially seeing a North Pole approaching it, while at the same time seeing a South Pole being removed. Right? Now, in our previous exercises, we've seen that this creates a very similar reaction from the coil meaning it wants to repel the North Pole approaching but at the same time it wants to keep the South Pole from being where it is meaning the reaction you get from your coil is a North Pole at the top and of course the South Pole at the bottom of it using that third right hand rule we can see that the current with your thumb upwards your four finger four fingernails are going to indicate that your current is running this way that's essentially your first 180 degrees of turning. Now, if we look at the induced voltage, let's presume that this is a positive voltage in that first 180 turns, well, 180 degree turn that you're doing. So it will create a very fast change. That change will be minimal in flux once it's sort of perfectly uh, lined up perpendicular um, and then that change in speed will start slowing down in this case right so you get this first wave the next 180 degrees that we uh, we end up getting in this case now remember in this situation um, you're essentially saying that it's the North Pole Let's work with the green colors to make it sort of more obvious. You will have your north pole of the magnet down and the south pole at the top. When this happens, you will have a south pole approaching with a north pole being turned away. The reaction of the coil to this will be the exact opposite. It will create a south pole to repel this south pole and a south pole to keep that north pole where it is. Remember, your coil tries to fight the change that happens. If that happens, however, you will actually get your current 
flowing in the opposite sense in this case compared to the first 180 degrees meaning your induced voltage will also be similar in pattern but considered negative because it's going the opposite way so this is schematically how this things thing works when you start flipping it around now of course if you've at 180 degrees, you will have had 360, which would be the identical situation as our first 180 degrees. So again, the induced voltage in this case would look like this with the next bit being a green wave again, etc., etc. You get a perfect wave uh, of, in this case, alternating current and alternating voltage, of course. Now, what makes the difference between um, a dynamo and a generator in general, I don't want to go into too much details because it sort of detracts from Lenz's law at this point, but if you use a clever system with a commutator, like we've studied with the DC motor, you can actually manipulate your current in such a way that the negative parts of the, the, the induced voltage can become the positive parts by reconnecting uh, and by severing and reconnecting essentially your uh, your circuit so if it's a dynamo you would just flip the negative voltage around to create a positive one and so a dynamo generates its uh, its voltage and its uh, current in a sort of pulsating manner by using a commutator. So the first situation is one that would happen without a commutator installed. Uh, but if you use a commutator that constantly cuts and re um, and recreates the connection, you would get this situation. Uh, in general, the first ones are uh, devices we consider without a commutator, um, AC generators. While if you have a commutator, it tends to be uh, called a dynamo. This is the sort of thing you more commonly find on bikes. While com uh, without a commutator, the generator systems are usually for more uh, high power electricity generation uh, in this case. Now, I wanted to explain this using maths, which is tricky to do because I've heard from your math teacher that you're not quite at that level yet. Um, but if we remember what the equation of flux was, right? I've just dumped the number of coils, seeing as that is essentially the same value, and we take it back into account to the next one. You have to create the derivative of your function of flux. Now you want that flux is changing over time. And the annoying thing is, this thing doesn't have time in it at all. Um, it's just mentioning an angle, it's mentioning the magnetic field lines, which is Tesla, meter squared, and just angle, which is nothing at all in this case. So what you have to take into account is the speed of the rotation, the angular velocity which is expressed usually in degrees per second, so the speed at which that thing is turning. And if we want to introduce that physical quantity time into our equation, we can state that the angle in degrees is your angular velocity, the turning speed, if you want to call it that way, times your the time you're at at that time. And if you do that, if you just change out that angle alpha with angular velocity times time, you can actually start derivating this whole equation um, towards time. Now, this is a cosine function. The derivative of cosine function is a negative sine function. And we also know that the induced voltage is negative, the derivative of the flux function times the amount of coils you have in the whole thing. I'm not going to get too much into it. It's more important for me than that you see that this is the whole function. Now, 
you have a function within a function technically which is very mathematical uh, which means you have to put the derivative of your function within a function inside of the original derivative it'll make more sense once you get there in your math class right now very similarly when we're talking about this during time when we consider the first situation your coil is perfectly perpendicular to your field lines the function the cos the sinus of uh, this angle doesn't change all that much in the first few moments of it starting to turn so at this stage the change in flux is very low is almost at its minimal while if we reach this situation you will have a flux of zero however the slightest turn here will create another increase or decrease in flux if you will meaning the change in flux will be bigger at this stage if we have to actually put this on into um, into our graph it means that the change in this first part is zero because there's hardly any change once it's at its maximum however the change will become very fast until we get to our second situation at this point the change will be at its max meaning your induced voltage will also be at its maximum value as soon as it starts changing back you will see a decrease in your voltage going back until it is again i'm going to try to make as pretty as a wave as possible it's kind of hard to do with a computer mouse until you actually get to this situation again where it's perfectly perpendicular but that means your change will be at its minimum right now because your uh, surface has flipped 180 degrees in this third situation compared to your fourth we can consider this to become negative flux in this case again the change will be going faster and faster and faster until it actually is perfectly flat or nearing its flat state which is where the change will be larger and it will go back to a you know a slower change in flux as you go along and this creates that nice little sign uh, sine wave that you see in these uh, in this induced voltage that was it for this video i will see you in the next one where we'll be where we will be discussing a second practical application called eddy currents. I will see you then.